All right, so um, I was sitting there and looking at my own slide, and I realized that there was a, <laughs> there were a couple of very embarrassing mistakes. Uh, first, uh, the repo that you're supposed to clone is actually Bitcoin Edge Dev++, not Jimmy Song Dev++. So I apologize about that. And then I misspelled Dev++. So anyway, um, I'll let you guys uh, take a look at this and give you a few minutes. Um, and you can, you can do that while I sort of talk off the cuff a little bit. Uh, how about that price, guys? Like It's, it's above 7000 now. Um, I, I was joking with people yesterday that the market is responding to more developers being uh, coming into the ecosystem, which is always a good sign. And uh, somebody said, well, you know, in Aqua hires, each developer is worth like 250K. So, you know, each one of you is adding value to the Bitcoin network, hopefully at a rate greater than $250,000. Anyway, um, yeah, lot, uh, lots of stuff to do today. Um, I'm... Uh, if, if you haven't gotten a chance to do this, uh, you know, it's, it's best if you can follow this along and clone this repository and go through some of the Jupyter notebook stuff that I've set up for you. Um, but yeah, that, that repo has everything you need for my, not only for my session, but also for uh, John Newberry's session in the afternoon. So, the, um, you know, that's why uh, we moved it from Jimmy Song to Bitcoin Edge. And, you know, he's been putting in pull requests into Bitcoin Edge. So it's important that you get this particular repo and not that one. Um, anyway, here, here's how you do it. Um, you know, go clone it. Um, you know, make sure Python 3, Virtual Env, and Git are uh, installed, obviously. Clone it. Then go into the Dev++ and start a Virtual Env with Python 3 um, and not uh, something lower like Python 2. Um, and then activate it, and then you can install the requirements, and then you could go to Jupyter Notebook. Anyway, um, let me uh, let me just give you a short um, you know expectation here. Uh, first of all, uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to present you some material, okay, uh, about you know elliptic curves or finite fields or transaction structure or something, and then uh, I will give you a chance to ask some questions. And you're going to have some time to play with or study the code. Actually, I think the last two are backwards. You're going to have some time to study some code. I wrote some very readable Python um, that uh, if you took my other class, Programming Blockchain, you built, uh, we built. And, uh, and basically, you can go look at what the code does. And you know, we'll, we're going to start very basic, right? We're going to start from the very basic crypto primitives, like finite fields, elliptic curves. And then we're going to move on to elliptic curve cryptography. We're going to, uh, we're going, I'm going to attempt to teach you how the curves work and how that produces public key cryptography, because that's at the heart of Bitcoin, right? Like transactions and uh, transactions depend on the ability to sign and verify. And then we'll talk about transactions, uh, script, and two particular types of script: pay to pub key hash and pay to script hash. So all of that will be covered in the next three hours or so. I promise I'll give you some breaks. So don't be horrified at the prospect of staying here for three hours straight. Uh, if you want some water or oranges or something, please uh, like just grab a little bit. There's, there's water up here, um, some, some fruit over here. And you know I won't be offended if you just get up, grab something to eat, and then come back, go back to your seat. It's totally fine. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or something, just please raise your hand and um, you know speak loudly enough that other people can hear you. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, help everybody out by uh, by by doing that. All right, so here's what we're going to cover for the next three hours. Um, we are going to cover foundational math. Okay, um, that that's uh, I'll, I'll describe that to you in a bit. Uh, we're going to then go into elliptic curve cryptography, um, and then we're going to study transactions. Um, and that, that's sort of going to be roughly an hour each. All right, so we're going to start with something called finite fields. Um, and finite fields are a mathematical structure. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll describe it to you right here. What is a finite field? Well, it's a set of numbers. It's a set of numbers. That's really all it is, and it has certain properties. And uh, it's obviously finite, not infinite, right? Like uh, 
the, the set of all real numbers is infinite, set of all natural numbers is infinite, but finite fields in this particular case, it's finite. And that's a very important property because it limits sort of uh, the universe of all things that can possibly be. Um, and there are four operations in a fi finite field, um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, except division by zero. Note that these are all operations we are going to define. They aren't necessarily going to, uh, you know, jive with your intuition. You may know addition as like 5 plus 15 is 20. Um, and you'll see later that's not exactly right in a finite field, okay? Um, the only exception is division by zero. Closed means that if you, if you take two elements and add them, the result is also in the finite field, okay? Or subtract, or multiply, or divide. You may be thinking, okay, well, division's kind of weird because you, you have like all these like very small numbers or fractions. Well, we're gonna have to dev define division in such a way as, uh, as to be within that finite field. Um, and it's mostly used for elliptic curves for cryptography. It's used for a lot of other things as well, uh, as far as uh, mathematical structures go. Um, but we're going to study finite fields first, then we're gonna study elliptic curves, and then we're gonna combine them, and that's where we're co going to get the magic of elliptic curve cryptography. All right, um, and it turns out prime fields are the most interesting. And by prime fields, I mean that there are a prime number of elements in the field. Um, so it's a set of numbers, so when you have a prime number of those, uh, it turns out to be really interesting. So here's an example. Uh, here's the prime field of 19. It's denoted with an F with a you know, subscript of 19. And, uh, and this is what it looks like. We're, we're going to call the 19 elements of it 0 through 18. Okay? There are exactly 19 elements in a prime field, and that's, that's what it looks like. Um, you can have other prime fields like F97, it's 0 to 96, and you can have even much larger numbers, right? Um, 48,947 is a prime number, and the, a prime field of F48,947 40, is just 0 to 48,946. So that's what a prime field is. All right, so uh, before we move on to the actual operations, I want to remind you of something that you might have learned a long time ago, and, and that's modular arithmetic, okay? Um, some people call it wraparound math, some people call it remainder math, uh, but it's pretty similar, right? Like, uh, simple. Uh, you remember in elementary school when you did division problems, like, what's 11, uh, you know, divided by 7? And then you go, okay, well, there's 1, and the remainder is 4. Um, what, what we're doing is we're just taking the remainder, okay? The remainder is the modular arithmetic. You can do the same with 38 divided by 12. There's uh, 3 and then a remainder of 2. And uh, if it helps you visually, just think about a clock, right? That, uh, yeah. No, the field is every number up to 26. Yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, all the way up to 18, right? 1 minus the prime number. Okay, all right, so if you think about the uh, clock, right, and you go, okay, what hour is going to be 38 hours from now? That's what modulo uh, arithmetic is. So you, you'll say, okay, it's, it's 2. So that, that, that's how you, you can sort of think about it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, how we're going to define addition and subtraction in this field. And it's going to be exactly the same as modulo arithmetic. So for example, if you have 11 plus 6, that's going to be 17. 17 mod 19 is 17, right? Like it's like normal addition, like the addition that you are normally used to. Um, 17 minus 6 is 11. Again, that's the same intuitive understanding that you might have of subtraction. When you get above 19, though, uh, that's when your intuition might go a little bit awry, although with um, addition and subtraction, it's not as hard. 8 plus 14 is 22. Mod 19 is 3. So 18, 8 plus 14 is 3 in, prime, uh, in this particular prime field. Okay? 8 plus 14 is 3. Okay, and note that 3 is within, you know, 0 to 18. So it's within that prime field. That's how it makes it closed. And, uh, and you, can, you can do the same thing. 4 minus 12 is negative 8. Negative 8 mod 19 is actually 11. Okay, so 4 minus 12 is 
uh, 11, right? Like that, that's again, a little bit counterintuitive, but that's, that's, that's what we have. Um, and you know, if, if the negative number confuses you, just think about adding 19 until you're within the range zero to 18, and that's it. All right, so that's addition and subtraction. Uh, we can also do multiplication and exponentiation. Again, same as modular uh, arithmetic. So two times four is eight. That's not very interesting because it, it's sort of the same intuitive understanding of multiplication that you have. But when you get above 19, uh, 19 or above, that's, that's when your intuitive understanding might change a little bit. Seven times three is 21. 21 mod 19 is two. So seven times three is actually two in field arithmetic. Um, and similar with exponentiation, you could do 11 to the third power, it's actually 1331, mod 19 is actually one. So 11 to the third is one. Again, a little bit unintuitive, but it's, that, that's what it is. Um, and there's a nice Python function that, that helps you do this. Uh, it's called POW, and it will let you do uh, modulo exponentiation. So mm -hmm. that's 11 to the third power mod 19. And it's faster than, uh, than doing it sort of manually. Um, and for very large numbers, this actually ends up being a very important part. All right, and finally, uh, division. Uh, and this one is defined as the inverse of multiplication. So remember how two times four is eight. Uh, that's not very interesting. So eight divided by four is two. Okay, easy enough, right? Um, here, here, here's one that will start uh, you know, challenging your intuition. Uh, seven times three is two. So two divided by three is seven, because that's the inverse, okay? So two divided by three is seven, kind of very unintuitive, but that's, that's in fact the case in field division. Uh, same thing with 15 times four is three. Three divided by four is 15. Again, very unintuitive, but field division has sort of elements like that. And 11 times 11 is seven. Seven divided by 11 is 11. And uh, it's the inverse of multiplication. That's, that's kind of how you have to think about it. So the question you might have at this point is, well, then how do you actually figure out the division, right? Like, how do you analytically get the division? Well, that... For that, we require Fermat's little theorem, and this only works with prime fields. And it's due to his theorem, which, which states this, n to the p minus one equals one mod p. And this is true for any p uh, that's prime and any n. Uh, it doesn't matter what the n is as long as it's not zero. Uh, so works for all n greater than zero if, if p is prime. This means that one over n, another way to sort of write that is n to the minus one. Uh, so you, and it turns out you can just uh, add p minus one to the exponent as much as you want because that's equal to one mod p. So that, uh, so one over n is actually n to the p minus two mod p, which means we can do division, okay? We can do division. So let's, let's remember, so how do we calculate division? All right, so n to the p minus one equals one implies that one over n is actually equal to n to the p minus two. So that means two divided by three is two times one divided by three. That, that much should be easy. But one divided by three is equal to three to the p minus two, which is p is 19, so three to the 17. And you can actually do this in your Jupyter notebook or something and, and check. Two, to, two times three to the 17 mod 19 is actually seven. And you can analytically calculate it. Uh, but this should also give you some intuition as to why, uh, you know, division kind of sucks. And it's very computing intensive because you're going to have to take it to these enormous numbers when we use much larger primes later. Um, again, three divided by 15, um, we, we can do the calculation. Three times one divided by 15 is, uh, you know, three times 15 to the 17. Fif 15 to the 17 is an enormous number already, and we're using a very small prime, okay? Uh, but but we, we modulo it with 19, and that's equal to 4. So 3 divided by 15 is 4. Um, again, uh, we, can, we can use the POW function, um, and this, this will help out in sort of lessening the computational burden on a computer. It's POW and P minus 2P. It, it sort of optimizes along the modulo exponentiation. Anyway, here are some examples. Um, you know, uh, uh, the library that I, I, I have in Dev++ 
um, has something called field element, and you initialize a field element with the actual number and the prime, and you can add, subtract, uh, multiply, exponentiate, and divide, um, and that's, that's what you're, you can do. So here's what I want you to do. Um, go to your Jupyter Notebook. Whoops. Um, let me move that. All right. Go to your Jupyter Notebook, um, and this has, uh, it, it, uh, this is what it should look like. It says, uh, you know, ECC has a class field element and field element test. Um, go take a look at them, and you can, um, you can click on ecc.py, and that has a field element, and it has uh, all of the operations that I described, right? Add, subtract, multiply, uh, armal, something else, but pow and true div. Um, and you can go study that for like the next few minutes and take a look and see if it matches your intuitive understanding of what we just did. Um, and I, I described to you like what the pow function does and all that stuff. So um, yeah, take a few minutes. There are trainers in the room, so if you have questions, you can you can ask some of them. But yeah, take a look at it and uh, and play with the Jupyter notebook and try to get get that going. All right. So the transactions um, dot ipynb is where you want to sort of play with stuff and. If you if you run this, it will sort of um, show you all the all the results, and you can see like um, you know two plus fifteen is seventeen, two times th uh, or you know and you know field of nineteen. You can um, a minus b, yeah, two minus fifteen is six, and uh, two times fifteen is eleven, and all that stuff. You can you can just play with it and try different things. Um, you know, feel free uh, to play with it. But shift enter, uh, if you don't know Jupyter Notebook, is how you kind of run it again. And you can change some numbers around. You can make this like 13 and see what happens. And you know, you get different answers for all of them. Um, but that, that, that's the idea behind, you know, utilizing Jupyter Notebook to get more familiar with, uh, with the concept of uh, finite fields. All right, so let's, uh, let's move to some questions you might have. Uh, do you have any questions on finite fields so far? Do you have any, like, does it make sense to you so far? Yeah, let's go over division again. Um, all right, so the, the key to division is Fermat's little theorem, okay? Uh, right, it's n to the p minus one is equal to one mod p, and that means that one over n, which is really n to the minus one, uh, is equal to n to the p minus two mod p, okay? Um, stated more simply, it's this. Uh, n to the p minus one equals one implies that n to the, oh, n, one over n is n to the p minus two. And that's because one over n is the same as n to the negative one. And, uh, and we, can, we can do, uh, division this way by taking one over three and recalculating it as uh, as three to the seventeen um, or three to the p minus two. Uh, turns out that division is the most expensive operation uh, in field math, and that uh, that turns out to be an area where you can optimize quite a bit. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Big picture, how is this all related to Bitcoin? Yeah, so big picture, we're, we're going to utilize this uh, for elliptic curve cryptography. And elliptic, crypt, uh, elliptic curve cryptography, specifically ECDSA, is what is used to secure every transaction. So this is the primitive that you need in order to understand ECDSA, and you need to understand ECDSA to understand actual transactions. And you need to understand transactions to learn about blocks and everything else. Transactions are sort of at the heart of Bitcoin, and uh, and you know ECDSA is at the heart of a transaction. And finite fields and elliptic curves are just something you have to learn in order to understand ECDSA. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, so n, n in that instance is, is going to be 3, right? n is 3 because you're dividing 1 divided by 3. And p in this case is the prime of the field. p stands for prime, so 19. So 19 minus 2 is 17. So it's 3 to the 17 is the same as 1 divided by 3. Other questions? All right, let's move on then. Um, all right, we're going to talk a little bit about elliptic curves. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll go over what the equations are and stuff, but I want to sort of start from a place of um, talking about like what you might have seen in high school, okay? So think about graphing, right? Like you guys remember this graph, right? So what is it called? Yeah, a line. It's a line, right? Like, and it's uh, y equals mx plus b. You probably learned this in like seventh grade or something. And m is the slope, and b is the y-intercept, and this, it's a, it's a very simple line, and the equation is y equals ax plus b. All right. Who remembers this? Okay, you guys remember the quadratic formula, right? Like, this is a parabola, and this is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, pretty, pretty, uh, you guys should be fairly familiar with that. All right, who remembers this? This may be like 10th grade, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a cubic, right? Like it's, it, it, it goes, it's kind of like an inverted parabola a little bit. <laughs> anyway, an elliptic curve is actually not that different. It's y squared equals x cubed plus bx plus c. And, uh, and the big difference between this and the previous one, right, cubic, is that uh, at least the top half looks very similar to what a cubic would look like. The top half looks very similar to a cubic, except it's a little flatter. Um, and the bottom half is just a reflection of the top half because of the y squared term on the left. So if, if y is a solution, then negative y will be a solution. Uh, but, that, uh, but typically, this, this is what an elliptic curve will look like. All right, so that's an elliptic curve. So here's the curve used by Bitcoin, SECP256K1, and it's y squared equals x cubed plus 7. This is the curve. And it's actually, you know, that, that's what the curve looks like over a real, real line. All right, uh, the key thing about an elliptic curve that somebody discovered is, uh, is something called point addition, and we don't have time to get into the exact specifics of it, but it turns out if a line intersects an elliptic curve at two points, it will intersect a third time. If a line intersects an elliptic curve at two points, it will intersect a third time. And this is true of any line that intersects uh, the curve. So, I mean, it can be tangent to it, in which case uh, it's a little different. Uh, but the only exception is if points are exactly opposite of each other. And you can sort of see it with, uh, with R and P plus G, right? Like, they're, they're exactly opposite, and it goes all the way to the, uh, you know, it can't intersect anywhere else. It'll go to infinity on both sides. But that's, that's what point addition is. Um, it, it's... It's, uh, it's, you find the third point that it intersects and you reflect over the x-axis and that's how we define point addition, okay? That's point addition. All right, so it turns out that we, we need that point at, we, we define sort of a point at infinity to intersect with two points that will intersect a third time, like two points that are exactly opposite each other, like R and P plus Q in this example. And, uh, and we add that third point, a point at infinity, so that it will intersect the curve a third time, right? Like that's, uh, and we do that for a very specific reason. But anyway, there's something called the group law for the point at infinity, and uh, you can, we're, we're defining sort of like point addition, adding points together, right? And we're, we're going to sort of define addition uh, with this in mind. So if you add any point, uh, add the point at infinity to any point, it comes back to the same point. And if you add the point and it's opposite, then it's going to come out to the point at infinity. 
So think zero as far as the point at infinity goes, okay? As far as point addition is concerned, the point at infinity acts a lot like zero. Um, here's the group law for x1 is not equal to x2. And this is, uh, this is finding the third point. And this uh, hopefully will give you some intuition. In order to find the third point that you intersect with, you need to sort of figure out the slope and then find out where it intersects and then get the point opposite. So, uh, you know, we define point addition, x1, x, uh, x1, y1 plus x2, y2 is x3, y3. And in order to do that, we first find a slope. You guys remember slope from like seventh grade, right? It's a change in y over change in x. And this is why it's important that x1 is not equal to x2, because if the x1 were equal to x2, then this slope would be zero, uh, the, the denominator for the slope would be zero. Um, x3 equals slope squared plus x1, I, minus x1 minus x2. You, we can derive this based on the equations, uh, but I won't do that right now. And y3 is equal to uh, slope times um, x1 minus x3 minus y1. Um, this is just the formula, and, uh, and we can derive it using elliptic, uh, the elliptic curve equation and you know, the line equation and figure out the third point that it intersects. All right, so here's an example. Uh, we have a curve. I'm going to purposely define a different curve than Bitcoin. Um, y squared equals x cubed plus 5x plus 7. So we want to find out 2, 5 plus 3, 7. So we can prove that 2, 5 uh, is on this curve because what's 2 to the third plus 2 times 5 plus 7? Can anyone do it in their head? So 2 to the third plus 2 times 5 plus 7. 25, right? And what's 5 squared? 25, yeah, so it's, it's 25 on both sides. All right, you can do the same thing with 3, 7. I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Um, but we find the slope first, right? The uh, S equals this thing, and the slope is 2. And then we can figure out what x3 is and y3 is, and, um, you know, so, and we get the answer. 2, 5 plus 3, 7 is negative 1, 1. And this is how we sort of work with elliptic curve point addition. Now, uh, if, what if the points are the same, right? Group law for x1 equals x2 and y1 equals y2. Well, then we have to find the slope, and it's, it's actually the point that's tangent to the curve. And in order to do that, uh, well, so we're defining it as like sort of this thing. Uh, we, we have to find the slope, and this is from calculus, maybe like 12th grade for my, many of you. Um, you find the derivative of x and the derivative of y, so that's where you get 3x1 squared plus a and 2y1. That's the derivative of the right side over the derivative of the left side. Anyway, the x3 formula and the y, y3 formula remain the same. It's, uh, you know, just the x1s are equal, so you can, you can uh, make it that way. Anyway, here's the example. Uh, we can create these points um, uh, in ecc.py. There's a class called point that you can go study. Uh, but basically, uh, if x is none and y is none, we call that the point at infinity. So think that you know, think of p0 as like literally zero, um, and p1 is uh, is one of the points on the curve y squared equals uh, x cubed plus 5x plus 7. That's what the a and b are, is, uh, is the coefficient in front of x and the, and the last uh, constant, um, and p2. And you can, you can do different things with it. You can add, subtract, whatever. Uh, well, you can only add right now, actually. Yeah, no, adding is the only thing that you can do. But, uh, but check it out, and you'll notice something. There's, there's no real pattern to point addition, right? Sometimes it'll, it'll be like the x and y coordinates will be way less, sometimes it'll be way more, and it's highly, highly nonlinear, and that's part of the property that we're taking advantage of with respect to ECDSA, which we'll study in a bit. But anyway, uh, please study these uh, two things, um, ask questions afterwards, and, uh, and you know, I'll be coming around and seeing how you're doing. <coughs> Anyway, the, the main function that you're going to want to look at is add. It does like when x is not equal to, x1 is not equal to x2, 
and when x1 equals x2, and when one of them is the point at infinity. Um, those are the main ones that you'll want to look at. All right, so let's, uh, let's take some questions on elliptic curves. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the fact that it's highly nonlinear is going to come in very, very useful in the next section. So um, it turns out for elliptic curve cryptography, oh, well, yeah, I got to press continue. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it turns out for elliptic curve cryptography, it's highly nonlinear nature makes it very hard to predict where it's going to end up. And we're going to combine finite fields and elliptic curves. And when you do that, you have a finite set that's extremely hard to predict where it's going, going to go. And that's, that's at the heart of elliptic curve cryptography. Yeah? This is the foundation of the SHA-256 hash, right? No, no. This is the foundation of ECDSA. So um, elliptic curve cryptography, it's for signing and verification, not, not hashing. Hashing is something different. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I'm I'm not sure, uh, but but basically you you need to define a point at infinity in order for the math to work out for point addition. Yeah. The uh, y coordinate from the sum. You can. Uh, there's no real intuition for it except that you know if you plug in the formula for a line and plug in the equation, um, that that's what you end up with for y. Yeah, as the third point. Any other questions? All right. Let's uh, let's let's get into the magic. Uh, so you're, I, I'm sort of feeding you vegetables right now, but I pr promise you this is you know going to have a payoff here. Um, elliptic curves over finite fields. Okay, so you can combine the two concepts. You can take an elliptic curve, and you can do it over a finite field. So here's an elliptic curve over reals. That's that's it looks like a nice smooth curve. It looks great. Um, you do it over a finite field. It looks like a complete scatter shot. Okay, that's what it looks like. Um, and that's okay, because it turns out all of the equations still go through. All of the equations for the elliptic curve uh, go through in a finite field. And what that, may, what, what that causes is that we have a finite number of uh, points in it, and we, have, and we can do the same math. So here, here's an example. So you could create a finite field element. Uh, and uh, A and B, and they, they're over the prime 137, uh, which I chose for some reason. And you could create these points, right? Like you can still create the point at infinity that's going to be none and none. Um, point one is a finite field. Uh, I mean, it's a point over a finite field. The X is uh, field element 73, 137. Y is finite field element 128, 137. And, uh, and you, can do, you can do the same. And you can prove that all the equations from the elliptic curve, like y squared equals x cubed plus 7, which is the one for Bitcoin, which is what we're using here, uh, those numbers will go through with the finite field math, right? You did the squaring, you did the multiplying, you did the you know, division, all that stuff. All of those equations still go through for the elliptic curve. And that's where we kind of get a lot of that magic. Um, and you could, you could try some of it. So take a look at this real quick. Uh, this is ECC test, uh, test on curve and test add one. Um, you can, uh, we're, we're defining uh, some of the, yeah, ECC test. It, it, it basically, we just combine the two concepts. We combine finite fields and elliptic curves. We're, instead of using real or normal numbers, we're using finite field elements into the same equations. And they all go through, which is really crazy. But that's kind of how math works sometimes. Like, you, you have a finite field, and you can plug in the same stuff in, uh, into all of these equations. But because we define them a certain way, they, they all go through. So take a look. 
try it on your Jupyter notebook. Um, yeah, try it on your Jupyter notebook. I think um, it's uh, yeah elliptic curves over finite fields, and you can you can try it, and you'll get like point addition with uh, over a finite field. So you could try a lot of different things. Um, and uh, the, the key though is that the, these numbers have to fit the equation. So x and y, so it's y squared equals x cubed plus seven, and it has to resolve in the field math. Um, and that's, that's how I found these points is 73, 128 will satisfy that equation. Um, and certainly the result will satisfy that equation, uh, but you, you'll need to do certain things. Uh, you can't just put in any random numbers there. All right, um, any questions regarding EC, uh, like elliptic curves over finite fields? So the, this is combining two concepts, yeah. Uh, uh, which number? The number that you described. Oh, yeah, I, I, I just didn't do, didn't code that, I guess. That's, that's about the only reason. Yeah. Yeah, so um, a line in a finite field is kind of a tricky concept. <laughs> Uh, it's it's not like over a real real number line like it looks like a line it, it doesn't look like a line in over a finite field so it's I, I I think if you wrap it around it might but it's it's it it goes all over the place because you have to continue it like it's not it uh, it'll sort of go off one end of the map and come back on the other side depending on like because it's wrap around map on both sides. And it will eventually hit that point, but it'll come close on all the other points. So it's it's hard to sort of visualize that way. Yeah. Yeah. They the finite fields uh, basic more or less represent integers, um, uh, and you know when when you do it that way, that's that's what. That's, it, it looks like this. It, <laughs> there's no real, it, it's hard to in, make an intuition about it because it's not smooth. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's move on. All right, so turns out that we can make something called a math, mathematical group out of this. Um, and a mathematical group is a single operation. It's uh, it's closed if it's if a b is in g, then a plus b is in g, and plus is the operation we'll call it. It's associative. It's commutative. Uh, this might be familiar to you. It's invertible, and it's got an identity. And it turns out that point addition gets us a group. Point addition gets us a group. Um, so you can kind of see that it's closed, right? If you intersect at two points, you'll intersect at a third point. Um, <clears throat> it's commutative. P plus Q is the same as Q plus P because you still end up intersecting at the same third point. And it's invertible because uh, whatever is on the opposite side, right? Uh, if you take the same point and do the opposite side of the x-axis, reflect it over the x-axis, that's, that's the negative number. Um, it's also associative, and this, this is a little bit, uh, you're going to have to trust the graph on this one. Um, there's no real easy intuition for this. But if you add A and B, you come up with that point at the bottom, bottom here, right, A plus B. Um, and then you add C to it, and you end up at this point. If you add B plus C first, you end up at that point B plus C. Um, and then you add A to it, and you end up at the same point, essentially. Both, both, uh, it doesn't matter which order you add them. And that's part of why you need to reflect over the x-axis, is uh, it, it, it ends up satisfying this property. Um, ki kind of random, but that's, that's how it works sometimes. Uh, so we could do something called scalar multiplication. And we start with an elliptic curve over a finite field and just pick a random point, any point, okay? Some random point. And then we keep adding 
to uh, that generator point. The same, we, we can add that point and then we, we have something called 2G, and then we can add G again, and we have 3G and so on because of associativity. Doesn't matter which you order you add them, until we get to uh, the point at infinity. And that gets us a finite group. And that finite group is highly, highly nonlinear. Um, so here's, uh, here's sort of like uh, some code to sort of see that a little bit. Uh, you have a field element, uh, you, you have a point, and you keep adding uh, to that point, that while loop at the bottom. Uh, we keep adding to that point until we get uh, the point at infinity. And it turns out that we need to add it to itself 69 times before we get the point at infinity. So um, that's what the arm armal, armal thing is about. So take a look at it, uh, and, and you know, please please take a look at that one. It is armal, and it, it sort of shows a bunch of ways in which you can combine a point with itself. You add the point to itself, and that's what we call sort of scalar multiplication. And the code is in ecc.py still, so you can go take a look at that. Um, Oh, we already have that open, don't we? Oh, yeah. Um, R mol. Um, yeah, so. We are very close to defining sec 256k1, so. All right, so any questions on this? Oh, yeah. So, you have the while loop in order to figure out its conversions on infinity or zero, right? Uh huh. Is there any other way of doing that besides like the brute force? Like, is there like. There is. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, It's in the code later with uh, S256, but it's a uh, short, short preview. It's called binary expansion. So you keep doubling it, and even if it's a very, very large number, you can get to it by doubling it many, many times. You take. Uh, you take a number and it's a binary representation, and you only add if there's a one in that, one in it. So that that that's something that you could take a look at in the code in a bit. Any other questions? All right, great. Uh, let's talk about scalar multiplication. All right, so we've been so far doing everything over a relatively small prime, right? Like 137, 19, or whatever. Imagine a much, much larger group, right? Two to the 256. Um, and imagine P equals SG, where S is really, really large, right? In the, on the order of two to the 256. Uh, finding P when we know S is easy. We just, uh, we just add, uh, you know, we do the binary expansion thing like I, I, I just mentioned, and we can, we can add enough, uh, we can sort of figure out where it's gonna end up. But finding S when we know P is not, okay? We can't, we can't figure out, okay, what did we have to multiply? And this has to do with the highly nonlinear nature of elliptic, of, of point addition, okay? It, it might be less, it might be more, it's, it's really hard to tell where it's gonna go. And, uh, and this is sometimes referred to as the secret exponent, and, uh, and if you, instead of using addition as the operator, if you use multiplication as the operator, um, you know, it looks like P equals G to the S, and you invert that, and that's uh, log G P equals S, and this is called the discrete log problem, and it's, uh, it's you know, as hard as factoring, uh, you know, a very large composite number with two very large primes. <clears throat> so conventionally, we use little s uh, for secret or scalar or something like that, and uppercase p for a public point or something to that effect. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we define an elliptic curve. We have the elliptic curve equation, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. We have the finite field prime number, p. We have the generator point, some g, okay? Um, we, we just sort of pick a random one with a high order. And the number of points in that group, n. Um, that, that sort of defines an elliptic curve. And uh, sec p256k1, this is the, uh, the curve used in Bitcoin 
has this equation, y squared equals x cubed plus 7, where a is 0 and b is 7, right? And the prime field is a very large prime number, 2 to the 256 minus 2 to the uh, 32nd minus 977. That is a prime number. And a generator point, some random point basically, um, and it looks kind of random for that reason. And the order n. Uh, it turns out that most of the points in this elliptic curve over a finite field are in this group, almost all of them. Uh, and it's actually a very small number that are not. And by the way, SEC stands for Standards for Efficient Cryptography. That's where the SEC part of SEC P256K1 comes from. And 256, that's the number of bits in the prime field. So it's raised to two, 2 to the 256, so that's why it has 256 in the name. So if you see other curves like SEC P384 or something like that, the 384 just stands for the number of bits uh, in the prime field. All right, so I just want to impress upon you the fact that 2 to the 256 is a really, really, really big number, okay? It's roughly 10 to the 77th power, and the number of atoms in and on Earth is about 10 to the 50th, number of atoms. Number of atoms in the solar system, not much bigger, 10 to the 57th. Number of atoms in the galaxy, 10 to the 68th. We are still nowhere near. Turns out you need to go to the number of atoms in the universe to actually overtake it, 10 to the 80th, okay? Insane, insanely large number, yet it's expressible in just 32 bytes. Uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, of trying to brute force attack this, a trillion computers doing a trillion operations every one trillionth of a second for a trillion years will still do less than 10 to the 56 operations. So we're, you're, you're still nowhere near brute forcing this thing at 10 to the 56. And that's a trillion years of a trillion computers. And you know, a trillion's barely at the edge of our like, cognitive ability to think about. But it's, it's a really, really big number. All right, so here's how we do public key cryptography. The private key is the scalar for, for a generator point. So we're doing lots of point addition against itself over a finite field. And the public key is the resulting point, SG, right? Like, it's, it's, it's really just the two numbers, the x and the y coordinate for, for, that, uh, for that point. So it's really two numbers. Um, so the scalar is one 256-bit number, and, and the public key is two 256-bit numbers. Um, and really, when you have a Bitcoin private key, it's just that, that scalar. It's some 256-bit number. All, that, all of the securing that you're doing, it's really to secure one 256-bit number or something that can be stored in just 32 bytes. It's kind of crazy because uh, to generate that particular 32 bytes uh, thing is uh, going to take way more than the age of the universe to compute uh, by brute force. But anyway, here's how you get the public key from private. Uh, if you look at ecc.py, there's a, there's a generator point G that I, I've made uh, and a couple of other classes, S256 field and S256 point. Um, and those basically hard code the prime that's in SCC two P two fifty six K one. But anyway, here's uh, here's how you do it. Here's the secret uh, nine hundred ninety nine. That's a terrible secret. Don't ever use it. Um, a lot of brain wallets kind of work this way, where you know it basically encodes your word into some some number. Um, but that's that's essentially what they're doing. But yeah, you know, this is easily brute forceable. You can go through a thousand. Uh, point is secret times G, uh, and that's scalar multiplication. And you can look at the point. Well, here, here's this sort of random looking point. There's no real pattern to it. But that, that's what you would, you would hand out to other people, and you can, you can encode stuff with your secret. Anyway, take a, take a look at S256 field and S256 point. It, it has a lot of the constants that I showed you, and it's combining an elliptic curve over a finite field. Um, yeah, take a look at it. Please feel to ask me questions or ask your neighbor that understands better or possibly some of the trainers, so. All right, so any questions on this part? Uh, the SEC P256K1 curve and uh, you know what, what you're doing with it. 
because this, this, this is at the heart of everything, right? All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. Here are our Bitcoin addresses and how they're related to what we've been studying. The, so the SEC format is Standards for Efficient Cryptography, um, again. And uh, think about a public key. It's a point on the curve, right? It's got an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And you need to serialize that in some way, right? You need to put that on disk in some way. And the SEC format um, ha has two versions, uncompressed, which looks like this. And, uh, and that's, you, you have a 0, 4 as a marker. And then you put the X coordinate in 32 bytes as like, uh, you know, base 256, I guess, um, in, in, in as the first part. And then the Y coordinate. So it's X coordinate, y, 0, 4, X coordinate, Y coordinate. That's, that's what the SEC format is. The compressed version, uh, and this, by the way, was what Satoshi used very early on in the early transactions. He used all uncompressed keys. And in fact, compressed keys didn't come into effect until much later. Um, it's, it's hypothesized so Satoshi didn't know about compressed keys. But this is 65 bytes. And this is uh, before Bitcoin addresses were a thing, he would send the 65 bytes to you know, whoever wanted to pay him and or him or her or they whatever uh, pay Satoshi um, and and that's that's what would have happened all right compressed uh, looks a little different so it looks like that and it's you can you can tell first of all it's much shorter right it's only 33 bytes instead of 65 and the first uh, marker is 0 2 if y is even and 0 3 if it's odd remember for any x there are two y's only two y's that can happen right and there are negatives of each other, but in a finite field that's prime, the negative of an odd one will be even, and the negative of an even one will be odd, because it's a prime number, and prime number is greater than two or odd. So anyway, uh, so it starts with a zero, two if y is even, zero, three if y is odd, and then you just add the x-coordinate. That's why it's able to be much smaller, because it's a compressed, and why it's called a compressed key, because you're not spelling out y for the other person. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that, that's the SEC format. Addresses are, I mean, so SEC format is really encoding a point on the curve, right? An X, Y coordinate on the curve. And, uh, and when, once you've encoded that, this is how you generate an address. You take either the compressed or uncompressed SEC format, you SHA-256 and write MD-160 the result. We'll get to exactly why later. Um, and that's called the hash 160 in Bitcoin parlance. We're, we're hashing this thing in some particular way. And then we prepend the network prefix as 00, zero for mainnet, 6f for testnet. Uh, Litecoin uses some other prefix. Other coins use other prefixes. But th this is how you sort of identify it's supposed to be for Bitcoin. Um, and then add a 32-bit double SHA-256 checksum to the end. Um, and that's a way to make sure that the address is, uh, is not transmitted badly by like saying, saying something bad. Um, and then it's encoded in base 58, and that's a way to make it human readable. Um, so you, you, the example is here. I, I'm using the same terrible secret, uh, 999. And you can, you can look at the various versions. So every Private key actually has like two Bitcoin addresses that you can generate out of it because you can use the uncompressed sec format and the compressed sec format. Um, and obviously for testnet, it's going to be a little different. But take a look at uh, the S256 test. And you can take a look at what's going on. Um, let's see back here. <coughs> Yeah, so if you run this one, you'll get, you know, like addresses that look like Bitcoin addresses that start with a 1. Um, the test that ones start with an M uh, or an N, uh, and that's because of the poorly chosen prefix. Um, but yeah, uh, take a look at that, study it a little bit, and see, you know, just look at how it's constructed, because uh, that, that's how you get a Bitcoin address from a public key. All right, we'll, we'll do the next section and then we'll take a break um, just so you have some light at the end of the tunnel here. All right, any questions on the, uh, you know, SECP256 test or, you know, what we just covered? 
Okay, I, I think a lot of you, yeah. Wait, when you talk about uh, the compressed form, uh -huh. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I know that an X um, represents two numbers. Uh-huh. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but why? Why odd and even? Yeah. yeah. So what, if one number is even, right, and you take the neg negative of that, in a prime field, uh, that means that the other one will be odd. So they're, they're not, never going to be both even or both odd. One has to be even and one's odd. And so that, that's how you can kind of tell. Uh, that's one way to classify it, basically. Um, so think about, uh, so the field is prime, so, and a prime number greater than two is odd, right? And those two, those two y's have to add up to the sum of the prime field. So they, that, that's why. Does that make sense? They're, they're one, one has to be, if one is even, the other has to be odd. And if one is odd, the other has to be even. Just an effective way to compress it. Any other questions? I don't know if I explained that well. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, um, let's see, that's a good question. This is what line? Uh, 347. 347? 377. Uh, 377. Uh, yeah, so I'm doing that to return it as a string. Um, this is like a Python 3 thing. It otherwise will return it as a byte, as bytes instead of a string. And I want, it, like, it's supposed to be human readable. It's, it should be a string, yeah. But you don't have to do that. You can, it'll return just as bytes. And that looks fine. <laughs> yeah, the B, 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 uh, it removes the B quote. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? All right. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get to the actual signature algorithm and how you can use these secrets and pub keys in order to actually um, sign stuff. All right, so I want to give you an intuition for this first. Um, so we, we know this, SG equals P. This is sort of the main formula here. S is the secret, right? That's the private key. P is the public key. This is what you share with everybody. Um, and I want to, I want you to take a look at that, that equation, UG plus VP, um, where U and V are not zero, so there's some quantity of both. And I, I want to convince you or give you some intuition that this is impossible to manipulate unless you know how uh, G and P are related. If you know how G and P are related, you can do things with it. If you don't know what they're relate, how they're related, you end up with some random, random point, okay? So say you can choose U and V. You can only manipulate the sum if you know how G and P are related. And really, the way they're related is with the secret. So if you know the secret, you can manipulate things. If you don't know the secret, you can't manipulate things, okay? Uh, if you if you don't know the secret, this is going to end up sort of as a random point on the group, uh, uh, on the curve. If you know the secret, you can sort of manipulate things so that it, it ends up being something that you can uh, you can make into something. So if you do know the secret, then U G plus V P uh, equals U G plus V S G. Okay, uh, P is S G, so you just substitute that, and that's what you get. And you can factor out G from both of them and you get U plus SV. So you, you can sort of manipulate that quantity if you know the secret versus when you don't. Um, and that's kind of the basis for the signature and verification algorithm. You first start with a hash of what you're signing. You're gonna sign something, right? Like here's the check that you're actually gonna sign. Um, then you assume, next assume your secret is E, um, and we don't use S here as the variable name because it turns out that S is used later as part of the signature. Uh, so P equals EG. Uh, next, get a new random number K. 
okay? And we are going to compute kg, okay? And you have an x and y coordinate from the resulting point. We're just going to look at the x coordinate and we're gonna call that r. Okay, r. And we're going to compute s. Um, and s is going to be z plus r e over k. And division is the same as field division, except with n instead of p. Um, and and we, can, we can do that. And the signer can compute s since he has the secret E, nobody, can, nobody else can compute S. Um, and the signature is simply the pair R, which was more or less randomly generated, right? Because uh, you chose a new random number K to get that R. Um, and S, uh, which is sort of like proof that you, you have the secret, um, and that's uh, computed using this. And, uh, and the way you verify, oh, S has to be less, and this is a malleability thing um, that they implemented. This is like called a strict their signature. But S has to be less than N divided by two. If, it, if not, you have to use N minus S. But the, this uh, small implementation detail. Anyway, the verification algorithm, again, starts with the hash of whatever it is that was signed, right? It's whatever the check was or whatever. And you have the public point because that's shared with the public. So you have P. And you have uh, the signature R comma S, where S is uh, this quantity. And you can compute U, um, Z divided by S, and V, R divided by S. And you compute UG plus VP. This is the intuition I gave you earlier. You can only manipulate this if you know how G and P are related. Otherwise, this is going to be some random point on the curve. And, uh, and we can expand this out. UG plus VP, uh, U is defined as Z divided by S, and V is defined as R divided by S. And, uh, and uh, P is, of course, E times G. And you can factor out G, and you get Z plus RE divided by S. And S was defined as Z plus RE over K. So you, you, do, you factor all that out, and, G, uh, and we end up with kg, which uh, you remember, k was randomly chosen, and the x coordinate is r. So a lot of like signature and verification algorithms kind of are like this, where you start with a number and you end with the same number. You, you're sort of like closing the loop. You start with r and you end with r, right? And, uh, and if, if the x coordinate matches r, you have a valid sig. Um, and this is sort of characteristic of non-interactive proofs of one, one kind or another, is that you start with some random number and you can end with the same random number. Okay? And, that's, that, and this proves that you know, the, the person that uh, created the signature knew the secret. And that's, that's, at the, uh, that's the essence of it, is that you don't, you don't need to know the, you, you never use E as part of the verification algorithm. You just, uh, you calculate U and V and then calculate this quantity and it, uh, uh, you end up with the X coordinate the same as what you started with. Anyway, here's an example. Uh, I chose some random Z. This is like the hash that you're signing, interpreted as a number. Again, we're using the same terrible secret, and we're going to make this private key, and we have the pub key, priv key dot point. You can take a look at the private key class in ecc.py, and we're going to sign with uh, sign z, which is the hash that we're signing. We're going to print the signature, and we're going to verify the signature, and it turns out that the signature is valid. Anyway. Study these, um, and then after this, we'll take a break. Um, uh, yeah, study these, ask me questions, then we'll take a break. All right, so any questions on this stuff? Yes. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. So why does S have to be less than half N? Uh, that's a malleability vector. Um, so it turned out that uh, what people were doing to malleate transactions was change the signature so that the S part was N minus S, and that would give two versions of the same transaction, and they wanted to eliminate that vector. If you, if you substitute it with N minus S, it turns out all the signatures go through and everything. 
but uh, you don't want two versions of the same transaction. So they, they said, okay, we're just going to always use the lower one. And uh, upper ones are still valid on the blockchain, but they're not going to get relayed. So that's, that's what that was. Actually, BIP66, I don't know. Uh, John, do you know? If uh, BIP66 enforces the you know, half N rule? Okay, all right, well, I guess we'll have to take a look later. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so a normal interactive proof is where um, I can check, like if you had the private key and I were trying to find out if you had the private key, I would give you a challenge and I would say, here's something I want you to sign. And then you sign it, and then you give it back to me. That's interactive, right? Because it requires a round trip. A non-interactive proof means that I, I, I construct the proof without your involvement, right? Um, and those tend to be really useful, a lot more useful, actually, than interactive proofs. So that's, that's, what, uh, and that's what we do with this. By the way, there's something called deterministic signatures where that random number K um, and R sub subsequently is uh, generated by something uh, as part of the transaction. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a way to sort of reduce malleability even more. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's the idea of signing with a private key without getting any input from anybody else. So you're, you're generating all the entropy or randomness in, in there, and you still prove it by sort of like coming back full circle with the, you start with R and you end, it, end with R. And you can't do that if you don't have the secret. And that, uh, that ends up being a very good property. And that's different because like, even though I'm still signing something, uh -huh. I'm going to send a message like the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the interactive ones tend to be very annoying because both people have to be online. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's more uh, feasible when for something like Lightning Network or something. I don't think they use interactive proofs, but if they, if they wanted to, they could. Um, you know, with something like Bitcoin, you, you need to sort of sign something and let it be out there. And, you know, Anybody that, instead of everybody that wants to verify issuing you a challenge and proving it, that, that would be way too crazy. Any other questions? Yeah. What does it mean to sign? Yeah, so start with a hash of what you're signing. So it's like, uh, here, where, what's the check? Right, like in, in Bitcoin parlance, it's uh, if you think of transactions as like checks, right? Like you're, I'm signing over five Bitcoins to you or something like that. That's the check. You need to sign that check or else it's not valid. Um, and you need the check. Uh, you need the check to sign first, and that's kind of what the Z is. That's the hash to sign. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, you, you said something about different private keys, sorry? So it, the private key is the same. Oh, so compressed versus uncompressed, yeah. So that, that would be the public point, yeah. Uh, that would be so you can have two different addresses for the same public point and the same private key. But as far as the signature, that that wouldn't change necessarily. You would just have like a different R or something like that because you you choose a random point as part of it. The private point is always represented the same way. The private point is represented in the same way. Well, there's something called WIF format, and that's the wallet import format, which I don't know if I'm getting to. Uh, but basically, it's a, it's a way to encode the 256 bits. Again, your private key is just a number. It's a 256-bit number. And, uh, and there's something called wallet import format that's human-readable. It's a lot like Bitcoin addresses. 
and uncompressed ones start with a five, compressed ones start with like an L or a K, um, and that's that. You might see it very rarely. Uh, some some wallets allow you to export it, but that's usually how you serialize private keys. Most of you are at least somewhat familiar with Bitcoin, and the, and Bitcoin has something called a blockchain, and it's just a really giant ledger, um, and you need to assign one. Uh, once uh, you know some Bitcoin from one person to another, this is how you do it. You you create a transaction. Um, addresses, uh, as we know them, the ones that start with a one or a three or whatever, um, they are really compressed scripts, uh, and we'll get to exactly what a script means in a bit. But here's a uh, here's what a here's what a Bitcoin transaction looks like. It has something called version. It's four bytes. It has inputs. Okay, some number of inputs, some number of outputs, and then something called lock time. And we'll go through what all of those mean. But inputs, there are two types of inputs. There are coin-based inputs. These are newly generated coins that block, uh, you know, miners can create as part of a block, and, or a previous transaction output. Okay, it's something else that hasn't been spent yet, some output that hasn't been spent yet that you're allowed to spend. Um, input has various elements. It has uh, the previous transaction hash, unless it's the Coinbase, in which that's going to be all zeros, um, and the out, the out output index in that transaction. So uh, you're spending a specific output of a transaction. So a, a transaction may have like 30 outputs or something. You you have to specify which one of those that you're spending. Um, you have something called sequence, which is sometimes used by RBF or replaced by fee, um, but not used very often. And script sig, and this involves a script language, which we'll get to later. Um, basically, uh, the big thing to note here is that there's no amount, right? There's no amount of how much you're getting to spend. You actually have to go look that up on the blockchain, or you, you have to have some trusted third party that will tell you what it is. Um, all nodes have to validate these inputs as legitimate. So every node, uh, you know, looks up this input and says, okay, has it been spent yet? If not, that, mean, that means it's okay. If it already has, then it's an attempt at a double spend. And if it's a double spend and the transaction's been confirmed already, they're just going to reject it. Um, and, you know, uh, other things uh, related to that. Output has elements. Uh, there's an amount. This, uh, unlike the input, this actually has an amount, and a script hub key, and this uh, again involves a script language. Think of this sort of as um, as uh, an encumbrance or sort of like a lock that you're putting. Script sig, which is in the input, sort of unlocks it. All right. So what we think of as assigning to an address is actually a script and script pub key, and we'll get into exactly what the script language is about, but that's that's what it is. Um, and the amount can be zero in certain instances, uh, specifically with op return. Um, you can add 80 bytes uh, as part of it. And finally, lock time. Uh, lock time is designed to tell nodes not to let a tra certain transaction in until a certain time or a block height. So if it's less than 500 million, then it's a block number. If it's greater than 500 million, then it is a block, uh, it, it's a Unix timestamp. Um, but it's illegal for that transaction then to go into a block until that timestamp or that block number has passed. All right, so here's what a Bitcoin transaction looks like, and this is uh, the hex dump of a Bitcoin transaction, and, ho uh, and uh, hopefully I can point out what they are, and they're color-coded for, the, for a reason. That first part, the first four bytes, is version, okay? And the version for this Bitcoin transaction is one. And then the red thing afterwards is the number of inputs. Um, and in this particular transaction, there's only one input. And then this blue thing is a previous transaction hash. Um, and this is uh, the double SHA-256 of the actual transaction. So this is uh, 32 bytes. And then the previous transaction index, or like which, which output on that transaction you're spending. And then you have something called the script sig. Think of this as sort of unlocking that, uh, being allowed to unlock that particular transaction output. 
And you have sequence, uh, which is almost always all Fs or F E F F F F F F F. Not really utilized that much except for replaced by fee, which isn't utilized that much. Uh, zero two is the number of outputs. Um, in this case, we have two outputs. Uh, the green parts are the output amounts. Um, you know, and it's eight bytes. Um, so. You, many of you may know there's 100 million Satoshi per Bitcoin. Um, well, you need a lot of space to represent numbers kind of that big. Uh, let's see, the orange part is the script pub key. Again, think of this as putting a lock around that particular Bitcoin that only uh, someone with the private key can open. Um, and lock time, uh, in this case, it's uh, it's it's uh, less than 500 million, so it's a block number. And unsurprisingly, this transaction got in at that block number. All right, so here's an example. Um, we can parse a transaction. Uh, you know, we have to unhexify it to make it sort of binary. And then we can, we can parse that transaction and, and see the various parts of the transaction. So study these two, um, these two things, uh, it's in tx.py, not ecc.py, so you go to tx.py in your Jupyter, and you can, you can take a look, right? Like there's, uh, there's the various parts that I already explained to you, like, um, let me make this bigger. There's version, transaction inputs, transaction outputs, lock time, and like sort of indicating whether or not it's for testnet. You can parse it uh, by reading it, um, and byte streams are very useful for this sort of thing. Um, and you can serialize it or turn it back into a bunch of bytes. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, there's there are other stuff. There's other stuff like D and hash to sign and stuff, which we'll get to. Um, yeah, but the, uh, you can also play around in transactions, uh, the Jupyter notebook. Um, and you can see what the transaction looks like. It's, it's a version one, it's got at least one input, and you got two outputs and a lock time. Um, anyway, I'll come around if you have questions. And uh, move on to the next thing. Um, all right, so let's talk about script. I, I told you that I would be talking about script, right? Um, what is script? Script is a limited programming language, and it's not Turing complete. Um, you can sort of think of it as a smart contract language for Bitcoin. Um, and uh, it's a programmable way to assign Bitcoins. Uh, you know, you, I, I can programmably assign it. For the most part, you know, people only use sort of the standard ones, which are called addresses. Um, they're compressed scripts, right? Like they're, they're assigning from one person to another. Um, so how does script work? Well, there are two types of items, elements and operations. Elements are just data signatures, keys, hashes, whatever. And operations do something to the elements. So each element is added to the stack, operations do something to the stack, okay? Um, and at the end of processing all the items, there must be a single element that's not zero left on the stack to evaluate to true. That's, that's really all it is. Some common operations, op dupe, op hash 160, op check sig, op return, they all do various things and you can read about them. There's a whole list of different ops. Anyway, parsing script. Each byte is interpreted as an integer. If it's between one and 75 inclusive, the next n bytes are an element. Otherwise, the byte is an operation based on a lookup table. All right, so zero, uh, zero, zero is not between one and 75, so it's, it corresponds to op zero, which puts zero on top of the stack, zero five, is between one and 75. So the next five bytes are an element. 48 is uh, 72 in hex. The next 72 bytes are an element. 76 is outside, of, it's greater than 75. Um, and op dupe is, uh, is an operation. 93, 89, and many, many more. Okay, you can go look them up. Anyway, um, some common elements that you might see are public keys in the sec format that we talked about, compressed or uncompressed. Signatures in the dir format we talked about. Um, hash 160, these are like 20 byte things uh, as part of addresses. And uh, again, addresses are compressed scripts. So you have something like called pay to pub key, which was used very early on in Bitcoin. These are the ones that Satoshi used. Pay to pub key hash, it got a lot shorter. Pay to script hash, pay to witness pub key, pay to witness script hash, these are all 
sort of existing on the network. Anyway, here's how you do uh, script validation. You take the script sig field, which is the thing unlocking it, and, uh, and you process them. And you look at the previous script pub key and you process those. Um, and if the result leaves a non-zero element, you're done. So you might be a little confused at this point. That's okay, because I have a nice visualization to help you understand it. Here is the very first uh, uh, script, pay to pub key. And it looks something like this. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, here's the script pub key or the encumbrance. It's, uh, it's, it's in sec format, and uh, you have the pub key in sec format, and then AC, which corresponds to op check sig. And script sig is a spending thing, and it has a, it, just one element, a signature in their format. And you can kind of see why it's called script pub key and script sig, because script pub key literally has the pub key in it, and the script sig literally has the signature in it. And you know they're both part of the script language, right? Like that's that's why the fields are called what they are. Um, you'll see later that those don't quite apply anymore. But uh, but here's what you do: you take the script pub key, which has those uh, you have you have the pub key element and op check sig, and you have the script sig, which has a signature, and you combine them to get these three things. And uh, and you take those three things and you process them one at a time. A signature is just an element, so it goes on top of the stack. And then pub key is also an element, so it goes on top of the stack again. And then op check sig is an op operation, so you process the operation. And op check sig checks if the signature is valid for the current transaction, puts one back if valid, zero otherwise. Well, takes the two top two things, looks at it, pub key signature, say it's valid. You get a one. And uh, there's no more elements, so there's, one, uh, there's something on top of the stack. It's a one. It's, it evaluates the true. The transaction is valid. Now, it turns out that there are some problems with uh, pay to pub key, uh, namely that the pub key is like really big, right? Like it's a 65 byte thing that you have to pass around for someone to pay you. Um, and you know, uh, it's also a little bit less secure. So what they decided to do was do pub key, uh, pay to pub key. These are the addresses starting with a one. I already showed you how to make them. And they're shorter due to the use of RIPEMD160, which compresses to 160 bits. And it's more secure due to utilizing elliptic curve discrete log. Uh, you have to break both elliptic curve discrete log and you have to get pre-images of two different hashes. So you've got like sort of three layers of protection as long as you're not reusing addresses, right? Anyway, here's what it looks like. Pay to pub key hash. You have uh, op dupe, op hash 160, some length of a hash, op equal verify, op check sig. And the, the, uh, so this is the p script pub key, or the encumbrance, and here's the script sig, which, uh, which has signature and pub key. So if you notice, uh, pay to pub key, you move sort of the pub key from script pub key to script sig, right? Like as part of unlocking it, you reveal your pub key, okay? And so here, here's what, what the combination looks like. You have the script pub key, uh, which has op dupe, op hash 160, hash op equal verify, op check sig. And then you have the sig script sig, which has a signature and pub key. Great, you combine them and you get this nice stack. And we're gonna go through them one at a time again. Signature goes on the stack. It's just an element. Same for pub key. Now we start processing. Op dupe duplicates the top element and puts it on top. So you duplicate the top element. What's the top element? Pub key. So you duplicate the pub key. All right. Op hash 160 does a SHA 256, then a ripe MD 160 to the top element. Okay. We do that to the pub key up there and it becomes some sort of a hash. We put the hash up there because that's just an element. Op equal verify checks that the top two elements are equal. If not, fails the whole script. Otherwise, it gets rid of them. So assuming that they're equal, it just gets rid of them. Uh, otherwise, it would have stopped. And then op check sig, uh, checks the signature, if uh, you know, takes the top two, checks that the signature is valid with that pub key, and it is done, okay? And, it, and, and this ends up being a lot shorter, right? Like, it's a 20 byte, uh, uh, you only need to send those 20 bytes in the, in the uh, ripe MD160 hash instead of, you know, 65 bytes that Satoshi was sending before. And, uh, and it's also more secure and things like that. So, um, 
I would have you take a look at this, but I, I, I think you guys are getting hungry, so I'm gonna kind of go through the next part. Transaction validation. So in order to actually validate a transaction, this is what every node in the Bitcoin network does. Um, first of all, they need to check that the inputs are unspent, right? Uh, make sure that this is not an attempt at a double spend. Um, and that, that's fairly easy to do as long as you have the entire blockchain. And then you need to check that the input amounts and the output amounts, uh, the, that the input amounts are greater than or equal to the output amounts. Um, the difference, by the way, is the minor fee. So it's, the minor fee is not specified anywhere. You actually have to calculate it by uh, summing up the inputs and summing up the outputs and finding the difference. Uh, in this particular transactions case, it's 40,000 Satoshi that was paid. Um, next, you need to check that the script SIGs are actually valid. And the script SIG sort of unlocks it, right? And, and in this case, it has the pub key and the signature. And you need to make sure that the signature is valid. Uh, the thing that you need to know is what the heck is the signature signing? You need to find the hash of, of something, but you need, to, you need to figure that out. And this is, uh, this is one of the shortcomings of how Satoshi did it, was that it requires a different Thing to hash every time uh, for every different input. And that leads to the quadratic hashing problem, which uh, SegWit solves. Anyway, to check the SIG, we, we, uh, we have to empty out the script SIG. Then we substitute it with the script pub key of the output. Um, so the previous output that you're spending, you put the script pub key in. Um, and then you append something called the SIG hash. Um, and in this case, we're using sig hash all. It's almost always sig hash all, and that means the entire transaction goes through or else the sign signature is not valid. You could do sig hash single, which says, okay, this particular output also has to be in the transaction, but the rest of it I don't care. There's, a, there's also something called sig, uh, sig hash none, which says you can spend it however you want, uh, which is like a great way to get your funds just stolen by the miner. So, uh, so those aren't really used, um, but this, this is what happens. You, you put in SIG hash all at the end. Um, just one note here, uh, Bitcoin Cash uses uh, SIG hash fork ID in those four bytes at the end somewhere. There's a bit in there that's uh, for their chain, and that's why they're strongly replay protected because signatures for one are not valid on the other and vice versa. Anyway, uh, we double SHA-256 this whole thing to get the thing that's being signed. That's the hash, Z, okay? And, uh, and you do the exact same thing that we talked about with signing and verification. Uh, you, you can get the R and S from the DER signature that's in there. And using that, uh, and the pub key, using those, we can, uh, we can parse and in, uh, verify each input. You can take the pub key, you can take the R and S from the signature, and you have the hash that you're signing, and you utilize all of those to see if the transaction input was valid, right? So that's the pub key and sec format. This is compressed. That's the uh, signature from the script sig. And, and this, is, this is how you would verify each input. Um, in this case, there's only one input, so it's, uh, it's relatively easy and fast to verify. Uh, but because of quadratic hashing, if you have a lot of inputs, it goes up uh, at, as the square of the number of inputs. Um, so there was one uh, block mined by F2Pool a few years ago. Um, some guy used the brain wallet cat to send out lots of little outputs. They thought they were doing a good thing by combining the, all of those UTXOs into a single one. But there was a transaction that had 5,000 inputs. And that took way that took way longer for uh, people to verify because uh, it goes up quadratically. So it was uh, took like a minute to verify for a lot of nodes, and that's a lot of time that they're not mining. Anyway, um, I would have you study this, but again, I think you guys want to go to lunch, so I am going to um, leave it to you guys to go study it, like during lunch or after lunch or after tonight or where, whenever it is you get a chance to read this stuff. Um, I, I do want to get this paid script hash because this is a really cool innovation that happened, um, kind of related to SegWit a little bit. <laughs> but basically, here's, uh, here's a sort of the history behind it. There was something called bare multisig. And bare multisig is basically a way of encumbering, um, uh, you know, uh, coins to more than one private key. 
So think about a, a, a lockbox with multiple keys that, that are required in order to open it. Anyway, uh, this was how Satoshi sort of implemented it. Um, and this is what the script pub key looks like. You have a couple of pub keys and you have, this one is a one of two. The 51 there is op one. So one of two op check multi-sig. And the, uh, and the script sig has to look like this. Op zero, we'll get to that in a minute. And then signature. And here's the script pub key, here's the script sig. You combine them and you get the script, right? And we're, we're supposed to utilize these, uh, you, we're supposed to go through them one by one. The X can be anything, uh, in our case it's zero. Uh, and then we put, in all, put on all the signatures, you put in M and then all the pub keys and N. This is M of N multi-sig, okay? Or five of seven, one of two, three of nine, whatever. Um, and then op check multi-sig is sort of does all the heavy lifting. It, ca it, it confer checks if M of these signatures are valid for this transaction and puts a one back if that is zero otherwise. So you, you just sort of end up with a one assuming M of those are valid. Anyway, X can be anything. Uh, it's, a, it's a bug uh, in, uh, that Satoshi had in the original implementation. Check multi-sig consumes one more than is necessary. Right, so it's an off by one error, so, um, and it would require hard fork to fix, so it's just, re you, you just have to put something there. It consumes one more than is required. Uh, there's no way to really make this an address, right? Uh, the, there's ju it's just way too long of a script pub key. Um, so people, uh, and big transaction output for the UTXO set, there's, there's a lot of problems with bare multisig. And this was abused. This was abused pretty badly. This is a stack exchange uh, question that I answered a few years ago. But basically, uh, the, the entire Satoshi white paper is encoded into the blockchain. If you run this particular script that I wrote as an answer to this question, and you have the entire Bitcoin blockchain, you will get the PDF of the white paper. It's encoded into the bare multisig. And it's done by putting it into, into the pub key, and you just, you just it's, uh, it, it's essentially encoded like 64 bytes at a time. And you combine, it, it has 937 output, or 47 outputs, and it's 64 bytes on a two of three multi-sig or something like that, and, or one of three multi-sig, so there's, uh, there's like uh, 64 times three, or 192 bytes per output, something like that, that times 947. That's that's the the size of the entire PDF. Yeah. Can you post that on the Slack group? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll 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 put this on. Yeah, it's uh, but yeah, you you can literally run a script if you run a Bitcoin full node and you have TX index enabled, I think. But you you press enter on that script and it will produce Bitcoin.pdf and you cl double click it and it's literally the PDF of the white paper, which is kind of crazy. But that's 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 kind of abuse, right? Like you're you're sort of utilizing the blockchain for storage and, uh, and you know, everyone else has to pay the cost of storing it. Anyway, P2SH um, uh, was meant to solve a lot of these problems. These are addresses that start with a three. You, you guys might know them. They're really flexible because uh, part of the script is, uh, is sort of kept by the creator of the address. And it's important that as the creator of the address that you keep this, otherwise you can't redeem it. And that's why it's called the redeem script. Uh, redeem script must be provided when spending. Uh, remember how sort of the pub key went from the script pub key to the script sig? Uh, we're doing that for more of the script with redeem script. Um, redeem script is at first treated as an element, but then it is interpreted as a script later. So here's what the script pub key looks like. A9, 1474, et cetera. A9 is just op hash 160, uh, and then you have a 20 byte element, and then op equal. And the P2SH uh, script sig is you have a bunch of signatures, then you have a redeem script. So here's what it looks like. You have the script pub key, op wash 160, hash op equal, op uh, script sig is op zero, signature one, signature two, redeem script. And you combine them, you get that thing, and let's process them one at a time. Op zero just puts a zero on the stack. The signatures and redeem script are elements, so they just go on top. Op hash 160. Hashes redeem script. So it becomes a hash of the redeem script. 
Then you put the hash on top and you look at op equal. Checks that the top two elements are equal. If so, put a one on the stack. If not, put a zero on the stack. So you get a one. Now, if you are non-upgraded node pre-BIP16, this is where you stop, right? And you look at the top element, it's a one, it's valid, and you're allowed to spend it. But if you're post-BIP16, you have this special rule. And the special rule is if hop hash, op hash 160 hash and op equal in that particular order happen, then whatever the redeem script was, you put back on the, uh, on the processing queue. This sounds like a hack, it is. It was a hack. And uh, there's a very particular reason why they made it this way. And, uh, and SegWit operates in many, many, many of the same ways that this did. But they did this for a reason, and this was part of BIP16, and it was hugely controversial. But anyway, let's look at the redeem script. Here's the redeem script. It has two pub keys, uh, two of two, check multisig. So you take that, you, you interpret the redeem script as elements of, uh, of the script, and you put it on the stack to process. So now you go, okay, all right, here's op two, that ends up being a two, and those two go on, and then you do op check multisig again. It's two of two multisig if the signatures are valid, and it, of course, you guys remember, op check multisig has an off by one error, so it needs a zero at the bottom. But anyway, if it checks out, then you get a one and you're done. So upgraded nodes do this checking, right? This special checking at post BIP 16. But pre BIP 16, they just go up to right before the special rule and they sort of terminate at that point. But that, 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 was, the, that was sort of a big innovation. Um, and it was, uh, it was made new as part of the introduction of P2SH and BIP 16. Redeem script will be added to the processing queue only if the hash matches the hash and script pub key. And redeem script substitution is a bit hacky. It was a huge controversy. Um, and, you know, I think it passed with like 55% or something like that. Uh, and, you know, it was sort of the segwit of four, five years ago or something like that. Um, uh-huh. Well, so uh, you, it's a soft work, so you only needed, uh, like, it was possible to spend the redeem script without actually having valid signatures and stuff like that. Um, it turned out that, uh, you know, like a majority of the mining hash power went with BIP16. So the minority fork never, like, was always overtaken, so nobody really tried to do that. Um, and that's, that's how it, it was enough to, you know, it, it, I think it required like a new version number in the block, uh, which was two or something like that at the, point, at the time. And in a, that's how they signaled it at the time instead of BIP9, which we do now. Anyway, here's what a pay to script hash transaction looks like. Um, again, version, inputs, previous transaction hash, previous index, and you, you can see this giant script sig. Uh, most of the time, the script sig is gonna be a, the largest part of a transaction, and it is certainly here. Um, sequence, number of outputs, there are four outputs, and you can see that the orange ones are the script pub key, pay to pay pub key hash, or addresses that start with a one, that red one is a pay to script hash pub, script pub key, and it looks a little different. The, the orange one start with 1976A914. Um, the, the red one starts with 17A914. So they're, they're slightly different. It's two bytes shorter. Um, and uh, yeah, you can sort of identify it after a while if you've been working with hex transactions. Uh, and then you have lock time. Anyway, uh, you create a P2SH address very similarly to creating a normal Bitcoin uh, pay to pub key hash address. BIP13 defines exactly how you do that. For mainnet, you prepend byte five. For testnet, prepend byte C0. Um, and you can, you can use, uh, use the functions there and you can, you can check it out. Um, do I have more stuff? Yes, I do. All right, all right, so. I, I'm going to skip that so I can get to actually verifying this, uh, the pay to script hash transaction. So you have signatures in the, in the script sig. And, uh, and what, what did this sign and how do we verify it? And this is something that everybody needs to do or every node needs to do in order to validate this transaction. Well, it turns out we have to do very, something very similar as before. We replace the script sig with zero. 
but we have to put in the redeem script instead of the previous script pubkey. And I have to tell you, this, is, this information is not around in many places. I searched for three days back when I was trying to learn how to do this, and I finally found out this is what, what, what you had to do is to put in the actual redeem script into the script sig field, and then you add the script sig hash as before, and then you hash this thing, and that's what gets signed. Um, and uh, when, once you have that thing, then you can, you can take the pub key and, um, and ver get the RNS from the signature. Uh, it, since it's in their format, that's what it looks like, and this is how you parse it. And you take the, <coughs> Take the pub key from the redeem script, and then we can we can verify using uh, using the uh, pub key and the signature and the uh, and the hash of the thing that we figured out how to get. But anyway, um, yeah, it's like eleven forty seven. So I will. Uh, yeah, I think uh, are we late for lunch already or? Can, can we go a few more minutes, Anton, or no? Okay, all right, so why don't you guys study, study all of this stuff. Like, I, I skipped over a bunch of them, but try them out. I'll show you what they look like here. Here's transaction verification. You can see that it returns true. Here's how you do um, P2SH addresses. Here's how you do P2SH verification. And you can take a look at tx.py. And, uh, and, you know, and, you know, just sort of study it, uh, you know, on your own time or whatever. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, functions in here that might be interesting or useful. You can figure out what hash to sign. This, uh, this is always a giant pain because of uh, the, you know, bad design around that signing, um, uh, which uh, SegWit thankfully fixes a lot of. Um, and then verifying inputs, um, signing inputs, things like that. Um, you can take a look at it. Um, ask me any questions you have, I'll be walking around. All right, so I, I think there's plenty of you, for you guys to study and stuff. Um, are there any questions uh, regarding any of what I've covered so far today? Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, limit is 15. Yeah, I, I think, and that's, there. there's some hard-coded thing or some uh, some limitation, I forget exactly which one. Any other questions? You guys are all hungry, aren't you? <laughs> all right, uh, I, I think Anton will lead you to lunch. Uh, follow this guy. All right. I can turn this off. <laughs>